Did you know Earth's first virus discovered in humans killed 13 times more people than a world war? Yep, this is a story about Earth's first virus. They preceded human evolution on Earth by 3.5 billion years. Neither dead nor alive, their genetic material comprises almost 10% of our DNA. They can attack all forms of life, from bacteria to plants to animals. And ironically, without them, humans may not have existed. Join us as we discover the origins of viruses. First, let's set the stage by talking about how many viruses actually exist in this world. If you'd know, there are around 10 viruses for every single bacterium on Earth. Yep, you heard it right. 10 viruses for each one of those bacteria buddies. That's a mind-blowing ratio, isn't it? However, it gets even crazier. Curtis Suttle, a scientist from the University of British Columbia, took a mind-bending approach to illustrate just how many viruses there are. He compared the number of viruses in the oceans alone to the number of stars in the entire universe. And guess what? Viruses outnumber stars by a staggering factor of 10 million. Can you even imagine that? If you decided to line up all these viruses, that line would stretch a mind-numbing 10 million light-years long. That's like crossing the galaxy and back. To bring it down to Earth a bit, scientists estimate that every single square meter of our planet's surface receives over 700 million viruses each day, and most of them come from the ocean. So it's like a viral rain shower from the deep blue sea. Now let's dive into the diversity of these viral bad boys. They come in all sorts of flavors when it comes to their genetic information. Some viruses use DNA to pass on their genes, some use RNA, and some even play around with both during their life cycle. It's like they're running their very own genetic lab, exploring different combinations and permutations. So viruses aren't just your everyday troublemakers. They're astonishing in their sheer numbers, outnumbering even the stars in the sky. And when it comes to genetic diversity, they're like the cool kids in the lab, experimenting with different molecular setups. But there is a problem. They are too tiny. In fact, they are so tiny that it took years for scientists to actually see one with their eyes. That begs the question, if the scientists couldn't see a virus, how did they come to know about it way before? These tiny creatures are so small that they can only be seen with an electron microscope. But long before this incredible invention, scientists already had a hunch that viruses must exist. How did they come to this realization? Well, they had managed to prove that there were particles smaller than bacteria that caused diseases. Imagine scientists working diligently, trying to solve the mystery of these microscopic agents. They devised a clever experiment using special filters to remove bacteria from infected tissues. The idea was simple. If bacteria were the culprits behind the infections, then the filtered tissues should no longer be able to make other organisms sick. But here's the twist. They found that the filtered tissues still remained infectious. This surprising result indicated that something even smaller than bacteria was at play. However, despite this evidence, scientists had yet to lay their eyes on an actual virus. It wasn't until the 1930s that the invention of the electron microscope opened up a whole new world. Finally, they could see these elusive entities with their own eyes. The story goes back even further to 1915, when an English bacteriologist named Frederick Twart made an important discovery. He stumbled upon bacteriophages, which are viruses that specifically attack bacteria. Twart noticed tiny clear spots within bacterial colonies and had a light bulb moment. Something was killing the bacteria. He hypothesized that there must be some mysterious entities at work, and those were the bacteriophages. So it took years of scientific exploration, clever experiments, and the invention of powerful microscopes for us to catch our first glimpse of these invisible troublemakers. And little did we know then just how influential and prevalent viruses would turn out to be in our lives. The tobacco mosaic virus holds a special place in scientific discoveries, as it was the very first virus ever identified. Back in the late 19th century, when the germ theory of disease was transforming medicine, Scientists stumbled upon a perplexing group of infectious agents that didn't quite fit the traditional rules laid out for the diseases. This peculiar phenomenon was first noticed in tobacco plants. These were the crops that had made their way from South America to the Old World through Spanish trade networks with indigenous peoples. 
Soon, it became a widely cultivated plant across Europe. In 1876, a German agricultural chemist named Adolf Meyer found himself studying a disease that caused mottling in tobacco leaves. Imagine weird patterns on the leaves. He named it tobacco mosaic disease and made an intriguing observation. He could extract juice from the leaves of diseased plants and use it to infect healthy ones. This experimental transmission hinted at the presence of a bacterium or fungus causing the disease. However, despite thorough microscopic examinations and attempts to cultivate the pathogen in the lab, Meyer couldn't find any organisms to blame. Why? Because we cannot see viruses without an electron microscope. Another scientist, Dmitry Ivanovsky in Russia, picked up where Meyer left off. In 1892, Ivanovsky made a remarkable discovery. He found that the infectivity of sap from mosaic diseased tobacco plants persisted even after passing it through a filter that retained bacteria. Around the same time, Dutch microbiologist Martinus Willem Bejerink made a similar observation. But Bejerink went a step further and proposed something radical. The agent causing tobacco mosaic disease was not a tiny bacterium, but something entirely different, a contagious living fluid. Now, let's take a closer look at the tobacco mosaic virus itself. It has a distinctive rod-like appearance, measuring 300 nanometers in length with a diameter of 18 nanometers. The virus is enveloped by a protein shell called a capsid, which houses its genetic material. That genetic material is a single-stranded RNA molecule. The capsid consists of 2,130 molecules of coat proteins that assemble into a rod-like helical structure, with about 16.3 proteins per helix turn. Inside the capsid, the RNA is coiled up and contains around 6,395 nucleotides. The virus's structure possesses both structural chirality and inherent symmetry, making it susceptible to chemical or genetic modifications. Interestingly, Tobacco mosaic viruses are now widely used as viral vectors in the field of plant biotechnology. Scientists harness the virus's ability to deliver specific genes into plant cells, leading to the production of plants with improved quality and quantity. Additionally, TMV finds applications in biomaterials and nanotechnology devices, where its unique properties come in handy. So, from being the first identified virus to becoming a valuable tool in genetic engineering, the tobacco mosaic virus has certainly made its mark in the scientific world. Now, for the discovery of the first filterable agent, aka virus in humans. It all began with the remarkable findings on tobacco mosaic virus in 1892 and foot and mouth disease virus in 1898. But the spotlight shifted to a different virus when, in 1901, the agent responsible for yellow fever took center stage. Yellow fever is a disease caused by a virus that can make you, you guessed it, turn yellow. Yellow fever, which probably originated in Africa, found its way to the Americas and nearby islands through the notorious slave trade, along with its mosquito accomplice, Aedes aegypti. In fact, the devastating impact of this disease played a significant role in Haiti's declaration of independence from France in 1804. The disease wreaked havoc on the French army, which had been dispatched to suppress a slave revolt on the island. Fast forward to 1901, and an American army physician named Walter Reed stepped onto the scene. He made a groundbreaking discovery, identifying the virus that causes yellow fever. However, Reed's success was built on the pioneering work of Carlos Finlay, a Cuban researcher who had hypothesized as far back as 1881 that mosquitoes were the culprits transmitting this deadly disease. Yellow fever became the subject of intense study due to its significant impact on the Spanish-American War in Cuba during the 1890s. Shockingly, about 13 times as many soldiers succumbed to yellow fever compared to those who died from combat wounds. This alarming statistic sparked a fervent quest to understand the virus and to find effective measures to combat it. So, from tobacco mosaic virus to foot and mouth disease virus, the stage was set for the discovery of the first filterable agent in humans, yellow fever. As scientific innovations came along, the world collaborated to develop a vaccine. However, still, yellow fever is estimated to cause 30,000 deaths each year. Even though the fatality rate of deadly viruses in humans have decreased since the invention of vaccines, 
researchers have estimated a 2% chance of the world facing a viral pandemic, like COVID-19, each year. And so, even with increased time efficiency of vaccine development for emerging viruses, we still stand at the mercy of scientists to save us from an eventual viral apocalypse.